For a while now, I've wanted to create a video that compares gaming performance of various Intel processors, from a gamer's perspective of course. The driving force behind this idea has been you guys, the Hardware Unbox tribe, my loyal subbies. Often I'm asked the question, Matt, how much better will games run if I upgrade my Core i3 to an i5 or even i7? It's an interesting question that isn't easily answered, hence the need to create this video. Ultimately, it comes down to two things. First and foremost, the types of games you play. If Rainbow Six Siege is all you plan on playing, for example, then don't bother upgrading that Core i3. It won't net you any extra performance. This is because Rainbow Six Siege is primarily a GPU-bound game, which means you'll be far better off investing in your graphics card than your CPU for this title. On the other hand, games such as Civilization Beyond Earth, for example, require a great deal of CPU firepower, and this is where your money will be best spent for performance gains. Of course, we're talking about gaming performance, so regardless of the title, the GPU plays a key role. In fact, your graphics card really dictates just how useful your CPU is going to be, even in CPU-intensive games. For example, pairing a low-end GPU such as the Radeon R7 370 with a powerful processor such as the Core i7-6700K won't be doing you any favours. This is because a much slower processor such as the Core i3-6100 will deliver the same performance regardless of how CPU intensive the title is. So obviously there's a balance to be had between CPU and GPU power, the problem being finding that perfect balance. In an effort to discover this, I'll be testing a huge range of Intel Skylake processors from the lowly Pentium G4400 to the mighty Core i7-6700K using three different GPUs. The graphics cards in question are the Radeon R9 Fury X, R9 390 and R9 380. Please note that due to the fact I've tested eight Skylake processors using three different graphics cards, only five games have been used. However, I feel these five games paint a very clear picture, and by that I mean they give a good indication of which CPUs best complement which graphics cards. Even though I've only tested five titles, there's a good mix of CPU and GPU intensive games. The mostly GPU intensive games used include Far Cry Primal and Rise of the Tomb Raider, while the CPU intensive games include The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Civilization Beyond Earth and Ashes of the Singularity. Finally, I'd just like to point out that all testing takes place at 1080p. There's little point testing CPU performance at any resolution greater than 1080p as high resolutions will result in GPU bottlenecks. In fact, we're already seeing this at 1080p on the R9 380. So if you're running at 1440p or higher for example, you can expect the performance margins to be reduced when compared to what I'm about to show you. Okay, so Far Cry Primal doesn't support dual core processors as many of the game's main assets run on the third thread so I couldn't test the Pentium processors. Moving forward, we see that even with the Fury X installed, the game doesn't appear particularly CPU intensive, as the Core i3-6100 was just 10% slower than the 6700K when comparing the minimum frame rate. Interestingly, despite the slight variation in the minimum frames, the majority of the processors tested produced the same 72 FPS average frame rate. Lowering the GPU rendering power with the Radeon R9 390, we see that the Core i3, Core i5 and Core i7 processors all delivered the same performance. Downgrading the GPU further with the R9 380, we again find that all tested processors deliver the same performance. Rise of the Tomb Raider can make good use of multi-core processors, but I wouldn't describe it as CPU intensive. Here the Core i7-6700K was just 14% faster than the G4400 when comparing the minimum frame rates, while the Core i5-6400 was just 8% faster. Now with the R9 390 installed, the Core i7-6700K is just 7% faster than the G4400, and what's a very slim margin indeed. That said, the G4400 clearly wasn't hitting the same highs as the average frame rate was a bit slower though this was corrected with the G4520. Here we see that with the R9 380 installed, all eight processors deliver pretty much the same result. In fact, all of them do with the exception of the G4400, which was a whisker slower. Despite testing The Witcher 3 in the CPU intensive town of Novigrad, we don't see a huge difference in performance from the G4400 to the 6700K when using the Fury X. In fact, here the 6700K was just 8% faster, which I have to say was a real surprise. Moving to the R9 390 saw a much larger variation in performance when comparing the dual-core Pentium processors to the four-threaded Core i3, and ultimately quad-core Core i7 processors. It's a bit strange that this wasn't seen with the Fury X, but these are much more in line with the results that I was expecting to find. Here the Core i3-6100 was able to get the most out of the Radeon R9 390 and was 22% faster than the G4400. The Core i5-6400 was actually slightly slower than the Core i3 processors due to its much weaker core clock speed. Now with the lowly R9 380 installed, it appears that the processor becomes far less important, as the Pentium G4520 was able to match the Core i3, i5 and i7 processors. Probably the most CPU intensive game featured in this video is Civilization Beyond Earth. 
Here the 6700K was 66% faster than the G4400 and 56% faster than the G4520 when comparing the minimum frame rate. The 6700K was also 33% faster than the Core i3-6320 and 10% faster than the 6600K. Going with the slower GPU in the i9-390 only reduced the 6700K's lead over the G4400 by a small amount as it's now 61% faster. The low clocked Core i5-6400 was only able to match the Core i3-6320 while the much higher clocked 6600K matched the 6700. Even with the i9-380 handling the rendering work, the 6700K was still 53% faster than the G4400, which dropped down to just 32 FPS. It's important to note that while the average frame rates don't show much of a difference in performance, the minimums tell a different story. Ashes of the Singularity provides us with a look at both DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 performance. Unfortunately, I'm only able to compare the average frame rates as the game doesn't report the minimum frame rate and I have no other means of recording it under DirectX 12 as programs like Fraps don't work. Nevertheless, the results are very interesting. The Pentium results are the most noteworthy for a few reasons. Firstly, although the DirectX 11 performance is quite weak when compared to the mighty Core i7 processors, it isn't that bad when compared to the Core i3 and lower clocked Core i5-6400 processors. The Pentium G4400 was 24% slower than the Core i5-6400 for example. Not a bad result given the Core i5 processor has twice as many cores to play with. However, once we move to DirectX 12, the G4400 becomes 28 percent slower than the 6400. While the Pentium processors fall behind, the Core i3 processors are able to roughly match the Core i5s and therefore the Core i7 processors. It is worth noting that although the Pentium processors didn't perform as well under DirectX 12, they still received a healthy 45% performance boost when compared to DirectX 11. Similar performance trends are seen when using the i9-390. The G4400 received a 47% performance boost when using DirectX 12, though this meant it was still over 20% slower than the Core i3 processors in the more modern API. On the other hand, the Core i3, i5 and i7 processors all delivered similar performance when using DirectX 12. Now using the R9 380, the GPU's limit seemed to be reached at 39 FPS under DirectX 11, as evidenced by the Core i7 6700 and 6700K results. This meant that the G4400 was 28% slower, while the Core i3 and Core i5 6400 processors were just 8% slower. Retesting using DirectX 12, we find that all 8 processors produced the exact same result of 41 FPS. So what can we take away from all this testing? Well, firstly, as many of you already know, there isn't a great deal of difference between the Core i5 and Core i7 processors when it comes to gaming. This is particularly true when comparing the unlocked 6600K and 6700K processors to higher frequencies such as 4.5GHz and beyond. Looking at the other end of the Core i5 spectrum, we find the Core i5 6400, a processor that can't work any faster than 3.3GHz and will often be found running below 3GHz during heavy loads. As a result, the higher clocked Core i3 processors were able to match and even beat the 6400 in CPU intensive games such as Civilization. Using the following line graphs as an example, we see the Core i3 6320 is capable of matching the Core i5 6400 when using high end GPUs such as the Fury X. The 6600K and 6700 are also comparable, while the 6700K only appears faster due to its higher out of the box operating frequency. It's clear that Civilization and games like it play best when at least 4 threads are available. Providing you meet that criteria, the next important criteria is the clock speed of the physical cores. The importance of the CPU clock speed becomes obvious when comparing the two Core i5 processors. However, although Civilization is primarily a CPU bound game, the performance difference between say the G4400 and 6700K won't be as extreme with lower end GPUs. In fact, out of interest, I threw in the GTX 750Ti, a popular choice amongst budget gamers. What I found was every single one of the CPUs featured in this video allowed for an average frame rate of 45 FPS with a minimum of 31 FPS. This then is why it's so important to match your GPU to your CPU or vice versa. For budget gamers using low end GPUs, there's little need for a Core i5 processor as it's very rarely going to be more useful than a Core i3 or in this case a dual core Pentium processor. It is becoming harder and harder to justify investing in a dual core processor like the $60 G4400. Still, given the performance that can be had in most modern titles, along with the fact that it costs half as much as the Core i3-6100, you can't go too wrong. Conveniently, picking up an affordable Pentium processor now still leaves the option to upgrade down the track, so it's not a dead-end scenario. 
Rise of the Tomb Raider, for example, plays surprisingly well on modern dual-core processors such as the G4400 or G4520. In fact, depending on the GPU being used, there might be little to no performance gain to be had when opting for a more powerful Core i5 or Core i7 processor. So the answer to which CPU do I need still isn't a simple one, but it ultimately comes down to which games you play and to a lesser degree the graphics card you'll be using. As a rule of thumb, sub $100 CPUs should be paired with a modern GPU that costs in excess of $150. The GTX 950 or R7370 would be suitable. The Core i3 processors work well with the GTX 960 or i9-380, while the Core i5s and faster are best paired with the i9-390, GTX 970 or faster. I hope you found this video useful. I'm your host Matt as always, and if you have any questions at all, then please leave them in the comments. Have a great day, and I'll see you guys next time.